Whelm fishing, one can sometimes get a strange feeling of being in the right place. Exactly, what triggers the feeling varies. It could be a rise, a sudden movement in the current, or a gentle tug on the line. But it can also be how the current flows, a rock, a tree, or some branches casting shadows on the water. This is one of those moments. The water flow is unusually low, only 3 or 4 cubic meters per second, and this spot has never looked as exciting as it does now. Filled with anticipation, I enter lay the fly in the water and let it sweep down towards the presumed holding spot. Usually, nothing happens, of course. There's no fish there. It's not interested, or I'm not doing it right. But sometimes it actually bites, a bit like a bowl from the blue, and then you suddenly stand there with a swaying rod and a fish on a hook. The pulse quickens, the fish make some hard jerks. Will it stay on? I apply hard, determined pressure on the fish. I want to gain control, not let the fish dictate the terms. Most of the time I succeed, but not always. The uncertainty is always there, especially if the fish is big and starts heading downstream. This time it goes well. I manage to keep the fish where I want it. It tries to use the current to its advantage, but eventually I guide it into shallower water. It's a nice sea trout, a beautiful fish in spawning colors. I bend down and grab the tail fin of the fish. I got it. Wonderful. I quickly check its length before I remove the hook and let the fish go. The sea trout swims away, seemingly as if nothing happened. I linger here and look out over the river. My pulse has slowed down, but my hands are still trembling. It's always like this after catching a fish, at least for me. I don't get used to it, and I don't want to. It's a pleasant, almost euphoric feeling spreading through my body. My senses are suddenly very receptive. I can truly take in the moment here and now and allow myself to enjoy it. Not just because the catch itself, but also being a part of nature, far from all the demands of modern society. Catch and release, in short, means that you first catch a fish, maybe take a photo of the catch, and then release the fish so it can live on and reproduce. This minimizes the impact on the species while providing an exciting experience for the angler, a pure win-win situation. Originally, catch and release was implemented to save species from disappearing from certain places. And of course, it still is. At the same time, the economic significance of catch and release must be taken into account. The salmon caught and released by a sport fisherman generates much more money per fish compared to salmon caught by an individual professional fisherman. The professional fishermen don't get much per kilo. Wholesaler, distributors and fishmongers don't make much either plus the fact that the resource is used up once it's caught. The salmon caught by the sport fishermen practicing catch and release on the other hand generates a lot of money for various actors such as tacky dealers, water owners, fishing guides and the tourism industry in general. But also for other businesses without a direct connection to fishing such as shops, restaurants and fuel sales.
The list can be long, and all this without using up the resource, the salmon. It remains in the river, albeit a bit shaken, but rich in experience and able to pass on its genes. Even for the species themselves, the application of catch and release is a great advantage. Since there is money to be made, the resource will be cared for. For example, through closed seasons, establishment in spawning grounds, nursery areas and investments in biodiversity. There are many emotions involved when it comes to catch and release because we all truly want the fish to survive and release in the best way possible. <coughs> there are many opinions on how catch and release should be applied, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good that we engage. However, we mustn't forget the most important thing in the context, scientific facts. If you read scientific studies about catch and release, it becomes very clear that there are three things that stand out when it comes to successful fish releases. These hard facts are Time it takes to fight the fish How the fish is handled once caught Water temperature In addition to the technical aspects, I also hope to inspire others to discover fly fishing as both a source of joy and excitement, but also a way to find that inner peace that being close to nature provides. When fly fishing, you don't observe nature from a distance, you participate on the same terms as other species. When I'm in the zone, I can truly feel at one with nature. And honestly, who wouldn't be raptured by this? All these magnificent views, the diversity of plants lining the river and of course the soundscape. All the birds chirping, the wind rustling through the trees and one can both hear and feel the power of the rushing water in the tumultuous rapids. And not to forget all these unexpected encounters with the inhabitants of the forest. One moment they are there, the next they are gone. It's like in a dream, and every time you ask yourself, did this really happen? Well, maybe it did. So try to take in the moment and just enjoy life. My ambition with this film is to show how I Based on these three hard facts, fish for salmon and sea trout in Murray River with a focus on catch and release. Hopefully it covers everything from what to consider before starting your fishing to what is important to keep in mind in various situations that always arise. But I also want to emphasize that catch and release can be done in many ways. This is how I, based on my physical abilities and supported by scientific facts act to be able to release a landed fish in the best possible way. So, let's go through the three parameters that According to scientific studies, matter most for successfully releasing a caught fish. And we start with Time it takes to fight the fish. 
The basic rule is that the shorter the time needed to land the fish, the better it is for the fish. This is related to the formation of lactate in the muscles. This occurs so that the fish can quickly produce energy to continue exerting itself. And when a lot of energy is produced in the muscles, in short time, hydrogen iron are released, which ultimately leads to decreased pH value in the blood. The muscles become acidic. This condition, acidosis, can affect everything from muscles, the nervous system, oxygenation and heart rate. If things go really wrong, it can lead to the fish not surviving a release. To avoid this from happening, to prevent the fight from dragging on, it's important for the angler to have the right gear for the specific fishing water. If we're talking about Murder River, there's a chance, or risk if you will, of hooking a salmon over 15 kilos, or why not a sea trout over 10 kilos? Then, it's also important to have equipment accordingly so that you have the opportunity to fight, land and release the fish properly. The fly rod should preferably be a two-handed rod in class 8-12, depending a bit on season and water flow. And of course, you should always fish with a well-sized leader. Personally, I prefer a monofilament leader of 0.4mm that I fish with all year round. Others may choose to fish with a 0.4mm during the May fishing for the big fresh salmon and then go down slightly in dimension during the summer and autumn fishing. It's also very important to have a pair of forceps with you. Then it's easy to unhook the fish. Remember that absolutely no one will be impressed if you fish with gears that is too light or with incorrectly dimensioned leaders. Fishing with inadequate equipment is just foolish. You learn that quickly the hard way. Trust me. One of the most critical moments when fishing is when you are about to land a fish. It can be particularly tricky in flowing water, especially if you fought to fish for a short time so that it still has a lot of energy left. The more fish you land, the better you become at this moment. But even if you have great experience, it can still be troublesome at times. Like here for example. I have a fantastic fish on the dock, but no really good spot to land it. The shoreline is high, the fish is lively and the water is turbulent. I can't quite get a hold of it, and chaos ensues. However, I managed to keep my cool and free the line that got tangled in my wading stuff. Eventually, with a bit of luck, I could still land the fish. If possible, try to put additional pressure on the fish. Presumably, it's tied at this point, and a little extra pressure can be crucial for a quicker landing. Make sure to have the forceps readily available so you can quickly unhook and release the fish. The forceps shouldn't be stashed somewhere where they are hard to reach. They should be out and ready to use. The most common way is to land the fish downstream from where you're standing, especially if you have assistance with the landing. Personally, I usually fish alone, so sometimes I choose to land the fish upstream from where I am.
But we start with how to easiest land a fish downstream. The easiest way is to steer the fish towards the shore and firmly push it up against the bank. Make sure to keep pressure on the fish at all times, but don't push it onto the land. Strand the fish at the water line so that it still can pump water through its gills. Try to grab the tail fin. Make sure to have a good grip. However, smaller fish are very difficult to grasp. In that case, it might be enough to just unhook them, and then they usually swim away on their own. Landing a fish upstream is sometimes preferable. It's not as common for me to land a fish this way, but I use this strategy if the shoreline is too steep, if it's too deep, or if I assess that it's safer to do it that way. This place might look easy to wade, but the pebbles are round and act like ball bearings. And it's very easy to lose footing. I know from experience, so I choose to err on the side of caution. If I choose to land a fish upstream, the fish comes to me. Downstream, I have to move much faster towards the fish. If there are two of you, the landing becomes much easier, but it still must be done correctly and in a controlled manner. The landing of a fish is always a critical moment and many things can go wrong. In this video clip, it's not me but my eldest son Martin who is filming and catching the fish. He has another angler assisting him, who has interrupted his own fishing to not get in the way and to be helpful if Martin wishes. So, I think this landing is a really textbook example of how a good landing should go if there are two people. It's Martin's first fresh run salmon, and despite his heart pounding hard and nerves on edge, he can still give very clear and relevant advice to the guy helping him with the fish. So I'm trying to dry in down here, though, a little bit less stream. I'm a whole new bird. Okay. Eller till dig men. Ja. Får den inte mellan benen okay. uh, och uh, ta den hårt i skärten när den liksom nästan ligger still på marken. Det är liksom ingen stress, verkligen ingen stress. And when the other guy keeps his cool and follow Martin's instructions, even though he hasn't been in this situation before, the land becomes exemplary. Everything is easy if you can and do it right. Som sagt va, jag kommer förmodligen ta den upp precis lite längre bort och sen kommer han nästan att ligga på sidan ungefär. Jag själv hinner inte riktigt bort dit innan den sticker. Så du får bara ta honom och trycka upp honom mot eh, strandkanten bara. Ja, akta så att det inte kommer mellan dig och stranden. Bara stå upp mot kanten. Nu om du kan. Perfekt. Kolla storlek på honom. In the end, it wasn't catch and release. As I mentioned, it was Martin's first fresh run salmon, so he chose to keep the fish. But that doesn't diminish the way the landing was carried out. Really well done, guys.
It's not over, just because the fish is landed. Now it's important to handle it correctly and enable a good release. The basic rule is that the fish should stay in the water the entire time you handle it. Unhook the fish in the water, do it correctly and as quickly and careful as possible. Remember that the fish is usually heavily stressed after the fight and lifting it out of the water creates great negative physical stress which significantly affects the fish's chances of survival. Unhooking a fish is always a tricky moment and it's crucial that it's done carefully and correctly. So, let's take it step by step. Keep the fish in the water. It's important to minimize stress on the fish. Preferably, let out a little line from the reel so that the line isn't taut. It gives you the flexibility when unhooking the fish. Set the rod aside so it's not in the way. Locate the hook and assess how you can best remove it. Use the forceps to unhook the fish. Grip firmly with the forceps, preferably in the bend of the hook. Be precise. Remove the hook with a firm pull in the opposite direction the hook entered. Check that you removed the hook. By following these steps, you promote the well-being of the fish and enable successful catch and release. Sometimes it can be better and easier to stay in the current both when fighting and unhooking the fish. I've increasingly began to use this strategy, mostly on smaller fish. Partly I avoid wading all the way to the shore with all that entails, and partly it shortens the time I spend fighting the fish. So it's a bit of a win-win situation, even though it can sometimes be tricky to get the forceps in the right place. The current affects the moment, and the fish is rarely cooperative. We live in a time where success is measured in likes on social media, and many of us therefore want to take a picture of the catch before the fish is released. I'm no exception when it comes to documenting. I film my fishing all the time with an action camera mounted on my shoulder. Generally, it's not important to spend time on the actual photography, but the main rule is that if you want to take a picture of the fish that will be released, it should be done as quickly as possible and preferably without taking the fish out of the water. Usually it turns out well, but sometimes not. And if the pictures don't turn out quite as expected, you have to accept it. The fish comes first in most cases. But a few times in your lifetime you catch the fish of your dreams and I don't think you should waste these moments. Remember, when shooting, it's crucial to understand how the light falls. Make sure never to photograph the fish in direct backlight. Then it would just be a dark shadow that no photo editing program in the world can correct. So, if you catch a fish in your dreams, take a little more time, be thorough, and give yourself the opportunity to capture this memory for life. The chance may never come back. However, always remember to follow any local regulations for handling fish. The hardest part is done. The hook is finally out. Now it's time to release the fish. Ensure that it remains in the water at all times. 
turn the fish against the current so that the water passes through its gills. If the fish is lively, it usually swims away immediately, but if not, give it the time it needs for recovery. Hold the fish still against the current, don't move it back and forth. When it wants to move, give it an extra push into the current. The third and final parameter that affects the fish chances in catch and release is the water temperature. The basic rule is that the colder the water, the better it is for the fish. This is because cold water binds more oxygen molecules than warm water. In other words, there is more oxygen in cold water, which in turn allows the fish to recover faster. So if you plan to practice catch and release, keep an eye on the water temperature. Not only is the likelihood of catching a salmon sea trout very low when the water temperature is high, but the fish's chances of survival also decrease significantly if it still happens to bite the fly. I am Ponyarab. So, if the water temperature is high, my advice is to do something other than fish. Sure, it might look like we are fishing here. But we're actually not, even though we happen to be by the river casting. It's midsummer and the water is too warm for the fish to bite. Ah, ja, det är jösses. Dra ju iväg den till andra sidan där om du vill. Elisabeth, my wife, wanted to learn how to cast a fly with a two-handed rod. So we simply seized the opportunity and spent a pleasant day by the river. Ja, ah, ja. Nej, det är... Jättebra. Kul. Well, that was quite a lot. So let me give a brief recap of the three things that have a proven impact on the fish's ability to survive, catch and release. Maintain proper and constant pressure on the fish when you're fighting it to minimize the time it takes to land it. Don't take the fish out of the water when you caught it if you intend to release it. Don't fish for salmon and sea trout when the water temperature is too high. Do something else instead, like swimming for example. I round up with a teaser that hopefully gets the adrenaline flowing a bit extra for the next fishing season. Because, is it true that we all long to once again cast the fly into the current, feel the strike, the heavy pulls on the fly rod, all while surrounded by the magnificent nature? I really love this, just thinking about it, I can feel it coming. Salmon fever. Fishing in flowing water means being surrounded by a constant rushing, bubbling sound. If the current is calm, the sound is lower, almost soothing. But if the current is strong, the sound can be perceived as both frightening and enticing. But regardless of how it sounds or looks, one should always respect flowing water. I personally like to fish where the current is a bit more turbulent. Sure, it poses a greater challenge, both in terms of wading and fishing. But at the same time, turbulent water often holds fish willing to bite, while in slower flowing sections it can be trickier to attract the fish to bite. Even though the flow in the river is relatively low, the stretch I'm on is very turbulent. This is partly because there's been some drop in elevation but also because the remains of the old mill race just above where I'm standing 
constrict the river and increase the water's velocity. I can't claim to have had particularly great success here, but I still like fishing this stretch. It just feels like a good opportunity, and it's also a bit of a challenge for me in terms of wading. I simply enjoy fishing here. Then, suddenly, there's a pull on the line. The bite is firm and determined. There's no doubt it's a hefty fish on the hook. And as often happens, it becomes a battle of wills. The salmon absolutely refuses to leave the opposite bank, and I want to bring the fish over to my side so I can land it. It can take a while to win a fight like this. The water is oxygen rich and the fish has the current on its side. I steadily apply pressure and try to push the fish as much as possible. I don't want the fight to drag on too long, but at the same time, I don't want to do anything rash. It seems to be a fine fish and I really like to land it. The best way to emerge victorious from this struggle is to keep applying pressure, to not give the salmon any opportunities to rest. It's a strong fish and in the foaming, relatively cold water the recovery time is shorter. So I continue to keep the fish in tight leash while trying to find a place to land it, if it comes to that. However, there's a small problem. I don't want to go too far downstream. Partly, there are boulders out in the current that could cause trouble, but most importantly, it's the large rocks by the shore that would definitely create problems for me. I managed to keep the fish somewhat where I want it, and after a while, it begins to show signs of tiring. I increase the pressure on the salmon and manage to guide it to a good spot where I can land it. I push the fish up against the shore and keep the line taut while moving as quickly and cautiously as I dare between the large rocks. It's not fast, perhaps calm and somewhat dignified, but eventually I managed to get a good grip on the salmon's tail. Caught, at last. I can finally breathe out. It was a tough fight among tricky boulders, strong currents and a salmon that really put up a fight. A truly fine autumn salmon. Yes, as you probably noticed, I'm not as quick as I used to be. H is catching up. Laboriously, I bend down to unhook the fish. It's an important moment to ensure the successful release, so I make sure to keep the fish in the water and to locate the hook. Digging around in the fish's mouth randomly is not a good strategy. It usually does more harm than good. Despite shaky hands, the salmon fever gets me every time I catch a fish. I still manage to easily and safely remove the hook. I double check to make sure I got it out before I start thinking about guiding the fish back into the current. Carefully, I turn the salmon's head into the current. I hold on to the tail and gently support the fish with my left hand so that it can stay in the right position. It doesn't take long before the fish wants to go. I give it a gentle push and watch it disappear into the swirling, tea-colored water. 